Hi folks, this is uh, part two of looking at water as a resource in the UK. Um, last lesson, you learned about the causes of a changing demand for water. You also learned that there are areas of the UK where we have a surplus of water, there are areas with a deficit, so not enough, and there are areas that are experiencing water stress, they need more water. We also started to look at how we can manage supplies by saving water and you did a poster on that. Today we're continuing and we're looking at another way in which we can um, manage our water supply and that is transferring it from an area of surplus to an area of deficit by using pipes. So in other words, building a, re a, a dam, damming up a river, building a reservoir behind it that holds all the water and then piping that water to the places that need it. We call that water transfer. The second thing we're going to look at today is um, water quality and how it becomes polluted and what we can do about it, how we can manage that. So just to start, here is a map showing um, England and Wales um, and it's showing you all the major water schemes that currently exist in the country. So all the blue dots that you can see are reservoirs that we already have and the black arrows you'll notice go from those reservoirs. Most of the time they go to the black dots which are the towns and the cities that have a water deficit that need so they need water. So if you look for instance right at the top of the map if you find Newcastle which is on the coast, you'll notice it's getting a, its water from a reservoir which is much further to the west. So these are the current schemes we have um, and the UK is trying to manage supplies by building more of these things. So the red dots are the ones that are potentially going to go ahead in the future. So these will be more reservoirs that will be added. So if you go, if, if we look at the, um, the red dot right next to um, Newcastle's reservoir, we've got the Kilda water reservoir and they're looking to transfer water all the way from there down to near, um, not far from Newark, all the way down to the Midlands. Um, and we've got another one in Birmingham, which is going to transfer water all the way to Banbury. Um, and so you can see we've got all these transfer schemes. The closest one to us is Rutland Water, um, which is, I believe, shown on the map. Um, it looks like it's that one, uh, if you find Banbury um, and follow the arrow up to the blue dot, which is written near the word Birmingham, that's probably the Rutland Reservoir. Um, and many of you may have been there. You might recognise some of the scenes in those photographs there. So using that as a little example, I want you to think about the opportunities um, that we can get from building these reservoirs. So not just the fact that it gives us a water supply, but other opportunities that a reservoir can bring. Look at the photos because you might get some clues from those. And what I'd like you to do is I would like you to put a title in your book which says opportunities of creating reservoirs. Do a little bit of research um, and use your own knowledge to brainstorm all the possible opportunities that Rutland Water can offer people. Use the photos um, off the previous slide, really rack your brains. You should be able to come up with things before even doing any research and then check your answers with mine on the following slide. Incidentally, the pictures that you can see here, the one at the bottom is the dam that has been created, which is keeping all the water in. And the bottom right is showing the building of that dam. Um, so there you go. Pause this slide, do that task. Don't spend more than five minutes, please. And then let's move on. OK, these were some of the things that you might have put down. So the social opportunities are leisure. Being able to use it to go cycling, walking, boating. You, you saw in the photo the splash park. People do bird watching. There's all sorts of leisure activities that are going on there at that, at that reservoir. Um, secondly, lots of schools do day trips to Rutland Water and they use it as like a, they do little field trips and they learn about ecosystems and environments. So it can be used as a way of enriching education. And thirdly, it's really good to have outdoor space for people to enjoy. It's better for people's health. So all of those things come under social opportunities. The economic opportunities, well, there will be um, plenty of jobs being provided at the reservoir. Uh, 
mostly for the locals that live in the local area. So it will improve the local economy because they'll be earning, they'll be spending, and that will improve the local economy. It will also lead to a multiplier effect because businesses, other businesses will set up in the area because of all the extra visitors coming in to use the reservoir. So before you know it, you've got a B&B &B will pop up, you've got a few restaurants and so on, and people start to generate more and more money. So that's economic. Finally, there will be environmental benefits from building the reservoir because you've created a big lake. So there'll be new habitats like lagoons and mudflats and marshes. And in turn, that will bring new wildlife to the area. For example, Rutland Water now has osprey and waterfowl. Now, these two species didn't used to be there and they've migrated and come into the area and now they're using the um, reservoir. So it's brought with it environmental opportunities as well. <clears throat> Add some of these ideas to your own columns if you didn't get them and then move on to the next slide. Now then, that was the opportunities. What about the challenges of creating reservoirs? Because when we build these things, we create all sorts of problems. That's a photo um, showing Rutland Reservoir before it was built. So that's why it's black and white. And you can see there, there is a sign there um, from the water board who is going to start turning that into a reservoir. You can even see the little stream running through it, which is what they dammed up to create the reservoir. Here's a bit of background for you. When over 3,000 acres of land in the Gouache Valley were flooded in order to create Rutland water, it was inevitable that a great deal would be lost. A pleasant rural landscape containing fertile farmland and natural habitats disappeared along with a way of life for those who had, who had to forfeit their homes, their farms and their livelihoods. An entire hamlet, that's like a little village, called Nether Hambleton and its connecting network of footpaths and roads to surrounding communities vanished. And these, along with other geographical features, were erased from the map. It's difficult to imagine this landscape without water, but fortunately, what lay beneath the reservoir is not entirely forgotten. By delving into a vast source of archival material, it's possible to form a picture of what the valley and the life within it was like in former times. Reports and artefacts from archaeological excavations, historical records, literature, old maps, paintings, photographs and people's memories all help to provide a picture of what used to be. When the reservoir was created, all of this area that you can see on this map was flooded. Because when you create a reservoir, you create a dam and the water collects behind it and it floods the land behind it. So all of Lower Hambleton here that you can see was flooded and lost. Here's a photo of it. You can see the stream running through all of that area. So those houses, the road, telegraph poles, any kind of natural habitats, trees, etc. will have gone under the water when the reservoir was made. So people living in these places would have been forced to move. Um, this is a, a picture of something called Beehive Cottage, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, that went under the water. That's the lady that used to live there. And in the background, what you can see is now all part of the reservoir. So there are impacts, and these are important. The social impacts are the displacement of people. People lose their homes. It breaks up the community. You know, people would have known their neighbours They living in rural areas, very, very close knit communities. They would have known their neighbours. And when they lost their homes and had to move away, they would have lost their sense of community, their friendships. Um, they will have even lost things like um, graveyards and where loved ones were buried. They would have lost livelihoods. Many of those people would have been farmers. They would have lost the farms, too. And they would have lost their history because it's all gone. So there's a huge social impact of building dams. Environmentally, the dam that's created will obviously disrupt the ecology of the river because now the river isn't flowing. The river is paused, isn't it, in a way. So the river is building up behind the dam to create the lake and it would block any kind of species that would normally migrate from one place to another. So it is going to have a bit of an impact on the environment in a negative way. It would have destroyed some habitats in the flooding. And obviously, in terms of the building of the reservoir and pumping the water to all those different places, that will obviously give off carbon emissions. So that's not good. Um, 
and there may well be water shortages in other areas once served by the river because obviously now the river has been stopped other areas that would have relied on on it um, may now experience a shortage and finally <clears throat> pollution can build up behind the dam so we do have an environmental impact even though we also have environmental opportunities and finally we have economic impacts dams cost loads to build they're very very expensive projects they require a huge amount of expertise um, a huge amount of technology and they take a long time to build they are expensive selling the water from the reservoir uh, once it's built will never ever recuperate the cost of building so they're very expensive um, and obviously another economic impact would be that all those people that lost their homes and lost their jobs they will have needed to have been compensated by the government so obviously there's a cost there as well so we've got um, challenges from building these dams and reservoirs and as the country tries to continue to build dams, dams and reservoirs they will continue to get a lot of people in a lot of com communities that complain because they don't want them so challenges and opportunities what i'd like you to do with, uh, is your task is put the above title please the challenges of dams and reservoirs i would like you to imagine that there's a proposal to create a reservoir near where you live and you would basically see your home go underwater you'd be forced to move write a letter to the government explaining why the community is unhappy about the idea i want you to use the information from the previous slides because i want you to get this into your notes but I want you to do it in a creative way where you're explaining. So please use the information from the previous slides to write a very, very persuasive and argumentative letter to Boris Johnson telling him why the dam should not go ahead. You should spend um, 10 minutes on that task. Okay, the second part of our lesson is looking at how we can manage water quality. Now there's a strange picture. What do you think that is? Pause this, just think about it for 30 seconds. What do you think it is? It's a fatberg and it made the newspaper, as you can see, it made the Guardian. This, uh, let's just read that. It says a lump of congealed fat and household waste was 40 metres long and so heavy it broke Chelsea sewer, costing Thames water £400,000. So what you can see there is just fat when you think about when you've uh, cooked sausages or something like that at home or a chicken and fat goes down the plug hole in the kitchen it goes into the sewers and it um, as it cools it solidifies and it causes that that's a fat burg now I'll let, I'll let you read that slide so pause this now you can read about that fat burg if you're interested um, but i shall be moving on there's another slide as well. Again, pause that, have a read and move on. So that's one way that we can damage the water quality in the UK. In other words, by putting things down the kitchen sink that we're not really meant to put down there. Um, there are other ways, though. You've probably seen photos like this before um, when you've been out on a walk, maybe around canals or rivers and you can see all the green disgusting algae that has built up on the surface of the water you may have never have wondered where that has come from it has come from the fact that the farmers on the fields in the areas are putting nitrogen and phosphates all over the fields in order to help the crops grow however when it rains the rain washes some of those um, some of those fertilizer ingredients the nitrogen and the phosphate into water supplies into the rivers and it gets into the lakes and it causes an overgrowth of algae because obviously that's what fertilizers do is they make plants grow so therefore it makes the algae grow and you might say well does it matter well it does matter because when you've got a blanket of algae like that look what happens to the fish underneath they die because they can't breathe the algae actually takes um, oxygen out of the water it's a process known as eutrophication and it causes fish to die so it, it pollutes the water supplies basically so that's another way that we can pollute okay this is another photo showing just general pollution getting into rivers so discarded materials finding their way into rivers 
I must reiterate, people don't go down to rivers and dump their uh, their wheelie bin into it. That would be far too much effort. This is um, this is waste that has just managed to work its way into river systems. It's been blown in or entered by, via sewage systems and guttering in the streets. Here's another picture showing um, oil spills from when we've been transporting products around the world. Um, accidents happen, leaks happen, leakages happen, and oil gets into water and obviously it has a damaging impact on the environment as well. And here's another picture showing um, chemicals and waste being discharged into uh, coastal areas. Um, it can be discharged into rivers as well. This is coming from our industries, from different industry industrial processes. So again, that can also impact on water quality. That there is oil on the road surfaces. Uh, this is all coming from cars, from our exhaust pipes. As we drive around, um, small amounts of oil get emitted into the um, into the atmosphere, and it all gets rained down onto the pavements and the road surfaces. So we end up with a lot of different chemicals that get washed into the sewers and end up in our rivers and lakes. So what I'd like you to do, please, is a short task. I'd like you to write a short paragraph which starts with the words water quality has deteriorated because of. I want you to use those previous six slides. You can listen to my commentary again. Um, to help you, please. So I'm looking for a paragraph which covers all six reasons to explain why water quality has deteriorated. Then you may move on to the next slide. OK, so how can we manage it? How can we make our water quality better? Firstly, we can build wastewater treatment works. That's a photo of one. Um, they look bizarre from above, from above, but all our water ends up at these places and it gets treated. These filter the waste to remove sediments such as silt, soil, bacteria, algae, chemicals, and they add chlorine. Um, you will have smelt chlorine when you've gone to the swimming baths, which basically kills all the harmful bacteria and purifies the water, making it safe for us to drink. And then it gets piped to the reservoirs and then obviously it gets piped to us. So that's what we can do. We can we can build wastewater treatment works. That's one thing. Secondly, oh, there's a list of some of the advantages and disadvantages of these things. Secondly, we can build what we call pollution traps. So you see here we've got a new housing estate in the distance and in the foreground we've got lots of like uh, grasses that it looks like. These are reeds and they've been purposely planted. So when new roads get built and new motorways, they tend to build these reed beds next to them because plants are brilliant at, at filtering pollution. When the water from, from, the, re, uh, from um, the road surfaces washes off into all the vegetation and the plants and seeps down into the soil, these plants have an ability to be able to filter out the harmful um, chemicals, if you like. So that's another way that we can improve water quality. They call, they call them pollution traps because it traps the pollution and filters, filters uh, the water, making it better. Again, here's some advantages and disadvantages of this as an idea. Thirdly, we can build green walls and green roofs so we can try and um, improve environmental quality that way. And again, rainwater will fall onto the roofs and the surfaces and it will be filtered and purified. And we have the advantages and the disadvantages. And finally, we have a few more ideas. One. We can legislate, we can make laws, laws that stop factories from polluting, fining them if they break the law. And again, in green, we have the advantages of doing this. So it's really easy, has a huge impact. And in red, these are the disadvantages. Nextly, we can educate people. We can make people aware. Don't put things like sanitary towels down the, down the toilet. Make sure you use the bins provided. We can educate people not to put fat down the sink or not to put um, any kind of you know, paint down the sink or white spirit or any kind of chemicals that you might use in DIY projects. We can educate people not to put them down the sink. 
Um, and finally, we can actually improve our infrastructure. We can fix our sewers, we can upgrade them so that we actually prevent spills and accidents from happening in the first place. To finish today's lesson, I'd like you to write one last short paragraph which starts with the words, water quality can be managed and improved by. You need to use the four previous slides to help you. I'm not asking you here to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of them. I just want to know how they can work to improve water quality. Well done. See you next time.